Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Get your Bibles out and move along with us. Thank you, worship team. Beautiful job. Hallelujah. Don't you appreciate our worship team? They just lead us in such a, they set the table for us. Amen. We've got a table. We've got a banqueting table. Let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I am grateful today for all the ways that you've given me victory. Jesus said in the world I'd have anguish and trouble, but he told me to be of good courage. I've overcome the world, and Lord, you caused me to overcome. I have the greater one living on the inside. I'm not afraid of any situation, but I can laugh at seeming impossibilities because I have the Word and the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 14 and also the next chapter, Acts chapter 3. And uh, let's get into the Word together. And uh, John 14, verse 12, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. They're a little bit uh, sad because Jesus is telling them he's going away. It's better that I go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Ghost won't come. And uh, they didn't know much about the Holy Ghost. Uh, they didn't know much about the covenant, uh, even though they were covenant people, old covenant. And even at this time, they're old covenant. The new covenant hadn't been wrought yet because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. So John 14, verse 12, he says to them and to us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, everybody shout, that's me. That's me. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Why? Because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's really in the Bible in red. Jesus said it. All right, and then as we turn over here to Acts chapter 3, verse 16, and this is... Uh, on the occasion of the lame man at the gate, beautiful, received his healing. He went walking and leaping and praising God. Everybody knew who it was. He was a, an approved beggar, approved by the Sanhedrin, so that Jewish people, in order to obey the law, they had to give alms. That's, that's money to the poor. He was, he was uh, qualified to meet that, that uh, qualification. If they gave to this man then they, they fulfilled that obligation they had under the law. And he was healed. And uh, it says here, and it, on the occasion, there's 5,000 men. That means at least 20,000 people gathered there wondering what in the world happened. Peter's telling them. He, he starts preaching at the occasion of this healing. And he says to them, and his name, that is the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So uh, my message today is entitled, Faith Makes a Demand. The word ask there in John 14 is really not supplication. You know, it's, you, you could say that's a great prayer. I've heard Brother Hagin say this is one of the greatest prayer scriptures. And it is. But it's more than prayer. I said it's more than prayer. Because the word ask doesn't mean beg. It doesn't mean the way that we think of ask. It really means in the Greek, uh, it means to call for, to require, or to demand your due. Faith makes a demand. Now, I can see some of you going tilt on that one because it sounds like we're being disrespectful. Well, you know, we're not demanding of God. God's not the one holding anything back. God's not the problem. We're demanding what? The devil take his hands off. 
We're demanding sickness to leave. We're demanding, amen, demon powers to go. We're demanding on the basis of our covenant. Are you with me now? Making a demand. I'm, everybody say, I'm making a demand on my covenant in the name of Jesus. See, faith makes a demand. That kind of Bible faith makes a demand. Jesus wrote this in the Bible. And what is the context? See, the context not even prayer, really. Now, prayer is important. We all believe in prayer. And we know when we pray according to his will, that is his word, when we pray the word, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the petition that we ask for. But guess what? We don't have to pray for things that Jesus has already bought and paid for. We don't have to pray for healing. We don't ask God to heal. He's already done the healing. What do we do? We make a demand on that covenant for sickness to go and healing to come. We call for healing. We make a demand. So in the context of this verse, one of the most outstanding verses in the Bible, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Anything. So what is the context? He said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. He's talking not just to the apostles in the first century A.D. He's not just talking to, to preachers. He's not just talking to pastors. He's not just talking to men. He's talking to the church. Thank you for two old me's and three grunts. Can I have a better amen? amen. Everybody say, he's talking to me here. See, when I got a hold of this 40 some odd years ago, it changed my life. I, I quit looking to other people. I quit looking. I, I mean, thank God for other people. Thank God for my believer, you know, other believers and, you know, and all that. But I mean, I'm not dependent on them. He said, what things you desire. If you, if you ask anything, I'll do it. Whatever you shall ask. Not mama ask, not daddy ask, not somebody else ask, me ask. And that word ask is not beg. That word ask is make a demand. So that's exactly what I see the apostles doing. Now, you know, the apostles, they don't know very much about the Holy Ghost. Now, they'd had some experience laying hands on the sick. Jesus, you know, when they first started ministering in his own hometown, they would, could, he could there do no mighty work. Why? Because of their unbelief. So he sent them, Jesus, and he, he responded to unbelief with teaching. He went about teaching, preaching, and healing. And so he saw the need. The people rejected him. They knew the miracles, but it didn't matter to them. They were offended to him. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. So what did he do? He sent his 12 out by two and two, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And they came back and said, Jesus, even the demons are subject unto us in thy name. So they knew a little bit about that. And then the 70, he sent the 70 out later on and, and said, you know, you know, just go on out there and uh, don't be afraid. You know, don't take a coat. Don't take any money. Just go. And if a, if a town doesn't receive you, shake the, shake the dust off your feet and leave. Don't just keep, you know, casting your pearls before swine. You know, sometimes we just need to, to, you know, move on to the ripe harvest. Sometimes people are not ripe harvest. So quit, quit bugging them. Just keep on moving. There's plenty of people that are hungry and thirsty for what you've got. And you might not have come across them, but you'll be ready when you do. Because then, see, so that's exactly what the, after Jesus died and, and, and all of that rose from the dead, and, and then here in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to go pray at the hour of prayer in the temple. They're still praying with other Jewish people and probably telling them about Jesus and all. That's the same group that said crucify him crucified. I mean, there are not a lot of friends in that group. It's funny. I mean, Peter was afraid of those people before, just a few weeks before this happened. A couple of months ago, he's afraid of them. Now he's going out and mixing with them. And on the way, they see this, this uh, man that everybody, Jesus saw that man. He's at the gate beautiful when Jesus was. Jesus didn't do anything about it. Jesus didn't heal everybody that he saw. He healed people that came to him. And this man didn't have any faith to be healed. He, 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 you know, Peter came up to him and John and, and at nine o'clock in the morning says, look on us. He fastened his eyes on the man. See, he was seeing 
the man's need. He was seeing what he really needed. He needed healing. He didn't need another alms. He didn't need money for his tin cup. He needed to not ever have to have to be beggar. He can, he can be, get healed. He said, look on us. And the man looked at them thinking, you know, he's going to get something for the tin cup he's holding. I don't know if he had a tin cup. It just sounds good. But anyway, <laughs> nobody has a tin cup anymore. They've got a bushel basket that they're ready for your dollar bills. But anyway, <laughs> they, uh, he said, silver and gold. I, I don't have any silver and gold for you. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not giving alms here. He said, but such as I have, give I, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Just in case he was confused about which Jesus it was. He specifically, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Notice he didn't pray. He didn't say, let's, brother, I, I feel so sorry for you. Come on, let me, let me pray for you. Oh, Lord, give him, give him the serenity prayer. Give him, you know, get, help him to make, you know, to be able to deal with this terrible 38 years he's been lame. He's been dealing with it 38 years, we find out later. No, he didn't pray a prayer. He made a what? I made a demand. I said he made a demand just like what we read there in John chapter 14. Just a few weeks before this occurrence, they were encouraged. He said, if you ask, if you make a demand in my name, when you're out there doing the works that I've done, I'm telling you, I will do it. I don't change. I'm not going to change when I go to heaven. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's, he is that Jesus through the church. That's why you hear me say this all the time. God's not going to heal our land. That's a stupid prayer for people that don't know their Bible. And I get so irritated everywhere I look. They're still praying that old, old covenant prayer that is so inferior to what we have. We're in the new covenant. Why don't you read your Bible? We have authority. We have that name. Oh, the name of Jesus. We haven't yet plumbed the greatness and the power that's in that name. And we have carte blanche. We have power of attorney. Power of attorney. You know, when you've got power of attorney, you've got total control over somebody's life. You know, bless, bless their little heart sometimes, you know, Folks that are a little elderly, they get a little ahead of, of God and ahead of their self, and they, they, they give their kids power of attorney over their, and, and they're still in their right mind. All of a sudden, their kids run all their business, and sometimes not to their advantage. Next thing they know, their house is sold, and all the money's divvied up. You think I'm kidding? I'm telling you right now, this is a cruel world out there. And you, you better not just give anybody the power of attorney over your affairs. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave the church the power of attorney to walk in his name and do the things he does. Greater works, he said. Greater works. Woo, glory. Come on, let's lift our hands right now. And so, you know, when, when he, he told that man, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine, he, did, did he do it just with a little weeny voice, you know, just a little old, oh, you know, sure would be nice if it's not too much trouble. Why don't you just wiggle a little toe and see if anything happens? No, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he didn't move fast enough, so Peter yanked him by the arm and pulled him up there. Doesn't sound like that guy had very much faith. You know, at you know, he couldn't run. He might have wanted to run, but he couldn't run. You know, he couldn't run the other way. He's got his captive audience. Peter lifted him up, and immediately strength came into his ankle bones. I tell you, sometimes we can get people healed strictly on our own faith. When we know what the name of Jesus has, when we know in our knower, down in our inside. See, God, Peter had enough sense to know that this was a divine appointment and that God wanted to do something for that man. And so that man went walking and leaping and praising God into the temple. I mean, and all those people, all those Jews, which just a few weeks before had been saying, crucify him, crucify him. They're out there, and Peter said, what are you looking at? 
What you looking at? As though by our own holiness and our own power, this man stands before you. Be it known unto you that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let's go back to Acts 3 and see all what he preached. I mean, you know, he kind of, man, he lit him up. <laughs> Peter saw it. He answered and said to the people, you men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Verse 12, and why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. See, that's the God that they, see, they don't know the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he had to talk to them in the terms that they're used to. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up. And denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. I just want to let you know, you messed up. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Boy, he's rubbing their nose in it, isn't he? I mean, he's not exactly being kind. I'm a little bit tired of these people that want to apologize for Jesus. They want to apologize for us. They want to apologize for how bold we are. You know, they're just, a, they're, they're, you know, we need to calm down a little bit. It's not be talk. Well, I don't know. Peter was pretty, you know, he had some salt and vinegar with his preaching. And kill the prince of life whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now, you know, the blood libel is an anti-Semitic trope, and it, it, it survives. People take this word, and and that's technically true, but Jesus didn't, didn't give them that power over him. He said, no man can take my life. I lay it down of myself. So they didn't kill Jesus. They are not guilty of his blood. And that's what people who want to justify anti-Semitism, that's how they get people revved up in anger against the Jewish people. They call them Christ killers. They say they're guilty of the blood of Jesus and that they deserve everything they're getting. Well, that's not true. Jesus laid down his life on his own. But in the context of this preaching, he's, what is he doing? He's pricking them. He's, he's getting them to realize that they've made a mistake. This is their Messiah and this is proof. This man walking is proof. Are y'all with me now? And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him the, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You know, we ought not settle for anything less than perfect soundness. We ought to not uh, settle for anything less than, than total provision. Just barely get along boulevard. We put up with it. Just barely able to pay the bills. Just barely able to get along. No, God wants us to have abundance. God wants us to have perfect soundness in our bodies. He doesn't want us walking around, limping around, hurting all the time, barely able to move. I tell you, I'm, I'm standing for perfect soundness in my body. Perfect soundness in Gladys' body. We're not giving up till we have perfect soundness. And I say we have it. I say it's ours right today. So. Got to call those things that be not as though they were. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, so the Pharisees, let's turn over to Acts 4, 16. And, uh, you know, that, that caused a furor. I mean, 5,000 people out there, uh, 20,000 people, and, and they got saved listening to this preaching. Motor, and, and so, you know, the Jews, they're, they're upset. They don't know what, they're jealous. They don't know what to do. They're, they're, they, this, these men are accusing them uh, of killing Jesus and all of that. And they're kind of a little bit, you know, they're getting a little worried now. They're not in the majority. It looked like, they, it looked like something's happening there. And, uh, and they said in verse 16, uh, Acts 4, 16, say, uh, uh, verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Everybody shout, notable miracle. See, that's what happens when the church starts making demands in the name of Jesus. Notable miracles start happening. 
I, you know, we pray for revival. Well, that's fine. Pray for revival. But it's going to take people understanding what they've got in the new covenant. It's going to take people that are tired of seeing folks sitting on the side of the road crippled and lame and do something about it. Allow your heart to have compassion on people that are sick. Are y'all with me now? What are we going to do about these men? There's a notable miracle. See, they gave the definition of a notable, notable miracle. One that is widely known and cannot be denied. Woo, you don't, let me tell you something. That's the substance of revival right there. When you start getting people that everybody knows their condition and you get them healed or you get them blessed or you get them changed, you get them saved when everybody knew they were an old reprobate. Let me, I'm tell you right now, that's the substance of, of revival right there. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Widely known and undeniable. You know, Brother Oral Roberts prophesied just about that same thing about this church. He said, you're going to see miracles in your church, John. He said, you're going to see miracles that will startle people. Amen. What's startle? <gasps> kind of sounds like revival, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like when they get the paddles out and pump up, put them on your chest, you go, <laughs> like that. I've had that happen to me, but I was asleep both times, so I didn't know it. I didn't know it. I came up out of that bed last time in August, and they put the paddles on me. They didn't do it to, to revive me like that. They did it to change my heart rhythm from atrial flutter to sinus rhythm, so they gave me a shock, same, same shock as you get when you resuscitate someone. And the heart doctor had bent over my bed and was holding me down. He didn't want me to hurt myself. And I almost knocked him and mocked him over. The nurse couldn't believe it. I mean, when they put the paddles to me, I come up out of that bed and he couldn't hold me. <laughs> He's a little guy and he needed to be a bigger guy to hold me down. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, people are getting startled. People are getting startled. That's what notable miracles will do. Hallelujah. We just haven't plumb the depths. And see, I'm going back and trying to teach you on faith again because, you know, we talked about meditating the Word. We talked about, you know, the power of positive expectation. We talked about, you know, your confession bills, your supply chain. What am I doing? I want to put all these, string all these faith messages together because we need to walk by faith right now. We need to live by faith as never before. Our faith is under attack 24-7. If you don't get any, any ammunition for your gun, you're going to go, you're going you're to be, you don't have any gun, ammunition. You need fresh ammo right now. You need, you need to answer these attacks of the enemy. He's, he's attacking our finances. He's attacking our health. He's attacking our nation. He's attacking, he's attacking everywhere he can. He knows his time is short. But I believe that the church is rising up and making a demand on its covenant. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> you know, Smith Wigglesworth gives a testimony uh, about a man that they call Lazarus. And Lazarus had uh, gotten saved. He had been working in the tin mines. And, you know, tin is, is a heavy metal. I mean, you know, like lead and, and those those kind of minds, I mean, you know, it's bad for your health. They didn't know that back then, that people would get sick and die early. Uh, lead and tin and even gold, man, all, those, all those kind of heavy metals get into your system, and they, they can really wreak havoc. And so it did. This guy got saved, and what he did was he would work all day in the tin mine, and then he would leave and go and, and preach all in the evening and get people saved, and he was just on fire for God. And he wore himself out. He just, you know, he just didn't use wisdom. He didn't get the proper amount of rest. And of course, the big thing was he's working in a tin mine. I'm sure that brought his uh, endurance down to the point where he got tuberculosis. And he had been bedfast for seven years. Still alive, but just skin and bones. Laying in bed. And, uh, and here was... Smith Wigglesworth was preaching in the area. He'd heard about Lazarus. And the Holy Ghost said, go raise Lazarus. Go raise Lazarus. <laughs> so he recruited some other believers, told them what he wanted to do. He said, you, you have faith? Yeah, oh yeah. 
I said, all right, well, come with me to Lazarus' house. We're, we're going to, we've got a, something, we're going to minister to him. So they went in, they, a number of, of believers stood around his bed, and all they did was just speak the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Amen. And faith in their heart that that name is above every name. Amen. They didn't lay hands on him. They didn't pray for him. They didn't command the devil to leave him. They didn't, do, they didn't do anything. They just spoke the name of Jesus. They just uttered the name of Jesus. Smith Wigglesworth standing there, and they're all around the bed. Jesus, Jesus. And after a while, I don't know how long, the power fell in that room. Got a hold of that man. He starts, you know, quivering, you know, under the power of God. And Wigglesworth said, there's your healing. Receive it. And the man said, I've been bitter. Now, they didn't know that at the moment. But right after he had gotten tuberculosis, someone had come from his church and anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord, James chapter 5. But he didn't receive his healing, and he blamed God. He was mad at God. He, he said, I've been bitter. Well, who was he bitter at? He, they didn't know that at the moment, but he'd been bitter at God. Bitter that the word didn't work for him. Took no responsibility for his own faith. And, uh, and so he'd been bitter. He's sitting there dying seven years laying there. And Wigglesworth said, well, repent. And, and the man said, Lord, I'm sorry. I believe healing is real and I receive it. And just like that, he got his healing. Just like that, the name of Jesus the, he, he, they made a demand on the power of God that fell in that room. Well, guess what? Whether we have, well, we feel the power. I mean, the power's everywhere. It's all in this room, whether we feel it or not. It's not a matter of shaking under the goosebumps or anything else. God is everywhere present. We can make a demand on the anointing. We can make a demand on the covenant. Glory to God. So when he, he gets up out of bed, he goes over and gets dressed, comes downstairs, starts, eats a good meal. That night he went to an open air meeting and testified of the healing power of Jesus. Come on, let's lift our hands right now. <laughs> Glory to God. Seven years. I'm telling you, we, we don't have to put up with what the devil is doing. Amen. We can have perfect soundness. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, the power of that name, his wonderful name. You know, believers have carte blanche. As I mentioned, they have the exclusive right to use that name. In Acts chapter 12, you know, the, uh, Paul had handkerchiefs or aprons laid on his, from his body laid on sick people. He, there was so many, so much demand for his ministry, he couldn't go everywhere. So they took handkerchiefs or aprons from his body and uh, took and laid them on sick people and they were healed. Laid them on people that had demons and demons left them. And there were seven sons of Sceva who were vagabond exorcists, Jewish boys that God was using to cast devils out under the old covenant. And I believe that they were effective in some way that way. But they began to go around and say, man, this works right over here. What he's preaching, I, we're going to preach that way. In the name of the Jesus that Paul preacheth. So they came to a boy that was possessed with a demon. And they said, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, come out of him. And that young man in whom those demons were, he said, well, you know, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? And that man, full of the devil, jumped on those seven, and they fled naked and wounded. Flee them at 11. We're going to see that on, at 11 o'clock now. I mean, yeah, it, that's in the Bible. Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Are they going to be able to say the same thing about you? Jesus I know, Paul I know, Karen I know, Dwayne I know, 
Debbie, I know. Are they, they going to be able to say that? Yeah, they're going to be able to say that when you know that you can make a demand on your covenant. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. I had no, they had no right to use the name of Jesus. They're not children of God. They hadn't been born again. We have the exclusive right to use that name. And we need to start using it more and more and more. Yeah. We need to get out of the habit of praying for things that Jesus already provided. He's already provided. He has not promised to heal anybody. Healing is a fact. It's not a promise. Deliverance is a fact. Well, though, but my, my, my daughter said she's got deep. Well, you know, you don't have to pray about it. Cast them out. Mama, cast them out. Well, I tried that. Well, that's your problem. See, you tried something. Don't try. You don't try it. You do it. Yeah. See, we need to meditate. See, it goes back to the other messages. You know, you've got to have a, the power of positive expectation. You've got to see your children free. You've got to see them. You've got a, a hope there. Jesus, you know, he's the deliverer. That's, that's available for my, my ch children. Uh, they don't have to be demon-possessed. They don't have to be hooked on heroin. Uh, they had the little girl on Channel 2. She's 17 years old. Her boyfriend died her and her boyfriend decided to, for the second time to, to experiment on heroin. How dumb can you get and still breathe? There are kids that are still dumb. They're still dumb. They're dumb out there. They've got dumb parents. They don't tell them anything. And they're going to go experiment with a drug that fentanyl, they're cutting it with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a, it's so cheap and it's deadly. And, and you know, they, so the second go around, their drug pusher they bought it from uh, had fentanyl in the drugs. And the, the boyfriend died, 18 years old, and she went into shock. And they had this nasal spray that they use to counteract the, the fentanyl uh, that will kill you right there. She, she said, I was, I was just on the ground having a seizure. And they were able to bring me back. I looked, looked up when I woke up. I saw all these people around me. But her boyfriend, that didn't, he didn't have a chance. He died at home in bed. And so she's on. I don't want anybody to suffer like this. Well, you know, I, I'm glad that you're out there admitting it. But I mean, how about, how about saying something stronger like don't ever experiment with any kind of drugs. It's a, it's a dead end. You're going to die in today's day because of the open borders we have. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody's saying anything about it. And people are dying every day with fentanyl overdoses because they're, it's disguised in the drugs that they want to, and you know, most of the Democrats want to legalize drugs. That's just going to legalize death again on the other side. Are you with me now? Oh, I tell you, thank God. Our, we don't have to pray for that to happen. We, we can demand the devil take his hands off our kids. We can demand the devil to take all, his hands off of our bodies. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost, which we have of God. And we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. We don't allow trespassers. We don't allow the devil to trespass on God's property. We don't allow him to poach and to steal uh, uh, what we have. No, we say it. We demand you leave us alone in Jesus' name. Are y'all getting the idea? We're going to have to be more emphatic about it. I said we're going to have to be more emphatic about it. And that comes from meditating on the Word. That comes from, from constantly exercising our faith. You know, when you've never done this for any kind of level, on any kind of level, you're not going to start off on the top rung of the ladder, are you? I mean, you got to start where you are. You got to start at, at the area of faith that you're in. And so if you've never believed God to get healed of a headache, you're not likely, you know, to, to know enough about things to get way up ahead of God. So start where you are. Start resisting the little things early on. Quit going to the medicine cabinet as soon as you have a headache. Rebuke the headache. Demand it to leave in Jesus' name. And then do like I used to do. If it doesn't leave, then go get to the no, then to go get the Tylenol. Praise the Lord. Why do you have to suffer? You don't have to suffer. You know, I want to get rid of pain any way that I can. But I'm going to build my faith in, to where I don't have to rely on drugs so much. Pastor, you mean you've never, you take drugs? Well, I've taken drugs before. I've taken Tylenol. I've taken anything the doctor says that I have to take to live. Yeah, I take some drugs, prescription drugs, medications, but I take them in the name of Jesus. I, I take them because my principle is I'm not going to allow this in my body. I'm going to resist it. Is this helping anybody? Today? 
I'm talking about faith makes a demand. 